أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي It is a pleasure to be here with you This is my first time speaking in Dubai Alhamdulillah Before I continue on this very important topic I want to ask every single person in this area i usually say in this room but alhamdulillah we're under the sky i want to ask every single person to do two things for me are we okay you don't know what they are yet the first thing is i want to ask every person sitting here to set an intention why are we here why did we come when there's so many other things you could be doing on a Saturday, why did you choose to come here? Every single one of us have their own personal struggles. Am I right? Is there anyone who's living in Jannah? Raise your hand if you're living in Jannah. I'd like to know how you're doing that. No one's living in Jannah, right? We all have our personal struggles. And so every single person has something that they need, something maybe that they're struggling with, a problem they have, a difficulty, a challenge. But I know nothing about that. You know about it and Allah knows about it, but I know nothing about it. And so first I want to ask you to set an intention of what you hope to seek. What is it that you need? What is it that you want to take home with you? Remember this, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَا نَوَى Verily, actions are by intention. And verily, everyone shall have that which they intended. So we can't get to a destination if we don't know the address. So we need to be clear on our goal. Set an intention within your heart. The second request that I have is make a sincere dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah allows you to go home with what it is you need. Allows you to hear the thing you needed to hear. Because although I have no idea about your personal individual struggles, Allah knows everything. So I want you to ask Allah to give you that thing that you need and to give every other person who hears this, that thing that they need to help them overcome their struggles. Cool? Can you do that? Yeah, thumbs up, you can do that or, th or thumbs down, you can't. All right, I'm gonna give you just a few seconds and I want you to focus on those two things. Can I see a thumbs up if you're ready? If you've done your homework? Yeah? You're not sure? Yes or no? All right, alhamdulillah. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salat wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlu al-uqtata min lisani yafqahu qawli. The status of women in Islam. What is the status of women in Islam? What has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given women in Islam? Well, if we rewind to our origin, and I don't mean our origin like, you know, we came from India or we came from Egypt or we came from Saudi. I mean our origin of our forefather Adam alayhi salam and our mother Hawa. If we rewind to our origin, thank you, we find that even before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, our father, and Hawa, our mother, he made an announcement to the angels. And in this announcement he says, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. 
Now there are different sort of theories about this life. Some people look at this life as a punishment. That this is a punishment, a time that we have to sort of do the time because of a mistake. Some people look at this life like a place of difficulty and pain. But what does Allah teach us in this announcement? What he teaches us is when someone is a Khalifa, what does it mean? He is telling the angels that verily I will place a deputy, a representative on earth. Now let me ask you this question. If a president makes you a deputy, makes you his or her representative, is that a punishment or an honor? It is actually the greatest honor because this isn't a president. This isn't a king. This is the king of kings. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that I am going to put a deputy, a representative of God, of Allah on earth. And so from the very beginning, even before he created Adam and Hawa, our father and our mother, he made clear that this was going to be an honored creation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us this. That indeed we have honored the children of Adam. And so as women, when we are trying to find our value, when we are trying to find our status, where should we find it? There's a lot of people who are going to give you definitions of your value, definitions of your worth. There are many people who are going to define your value and define your worth, for example, by the way you look, by the way you dress, by how much money you have, by your status. There are going to be people who are going to hand you this definition of your worth. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a completely different definition of our worth. As women and as human beings, children of Adam. And that is, inna akramakum indallahi atqaakum. Indeed, the most honored of you with Allah is the one who has the most consciousness of Allah, the most taqwa of Allah. So right away we see that the standard of our honor and our dignity and our status isn't how we look, how we dress, what we carry, how expensive our purse is. I have recently found out that purses are expensive and we are in Dubai. So, it is not based on these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us our worth. Now, when Allah said this to the angels, listen carefully, the angels replied with a very interesting and important question. The angels replied and said, what is translated as, will you place on the earth those who will spread mischief and spill blood, who will spread evil and spill blood. When the angels obviously celebrate the praises of Allah. Now this is a question, by the way, a lot of people struggle with. Now the angels are not arguing with Allah. Angels don't argue. But the angels are asking a natural question. Because one of the consequences of being human is that you'll be given choices. You will be able to take the wrong path. You will have the choice between the right path and the wrong path. And the Prophet ﷺ teaches us that there's only one right path and there's so many wrong paths. So many ways to deviate. So the angels are asking this natural question, which gets to the heart of human suffering. Spread mischief and spill blood. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds, I know what you do not know. What should we understand from this statement? What we should understand is that, number one, we should have comfort. Because it means Allah knows exactly what he's doing. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a test, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken something away from you, or Allah has tested you with something painful, something that hurt you, then Allah knows exactly what he's doing. It is not an accident. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah never ever puts a burden or a responsibility taklif except that which you can bear. He's never going to either test you or ask of you beyond what you can do, beyond what you can bear. So when Allah says, I know what you do not know, we should find comfort in that. Now after this, we know that Adam alayhi salam was created and Hawa was created and then Allah commanded the angels to bow to Adam. And we know that shaitan refused. And then we know that Adam was able to stay away from the tree and we know that he slipped and he ate from the tree. But here is where I want you to focus. Adam slipped. He ate from the tree. But here is the point. What did he do after he ate from the tree? This is essential because many of us, when we slip, when we make a mistake, when we let others down, we don't always know how to get back up. Many of us, when we fall, we stay down. We lose hope. That's not what Adam did. Earlier today when I was speaking to the school, I gave this analogy. That you know when you're driving in, in the car and you have an address in your GPS? Yes? No? Okay. <clears throat> and you know when you are driving along and you make a wrong turn? What does your GPS do when you make a wrong turn? Does your GPS say, you know what, you're actually a terrible driver. You should just park the car, turn off the car, and stop trying to drive. Can you imagine what would happen if the GPS said that every time we made a wrong turn? No one would get anywhere. Am I right? Have you ever made a wrong turn? How many people, raise your hand if you've never made a wrong turn? If you raise your hand, I know that you don't drive. <laughs> I know you don't have your license. So, yeah. It's impossible. We're gonna make wrong turns. The question is, what do we do after we've made a wrong turn? The GPS is actually programmed to say what? Recalculating. Make a U-turn. Make a U-turn. What is the GPS telling you to do? Tawbah. That's literally the meaning of Tawbah. Because Tawbah means to return. Tawbah is when you're on the wrong, you're going in the wrong direction. You know? Tawbah is when you've made a wrong turn, but you, you realize it, and you make a U-turn, and you come back to the right path. Isn't that necessary anytime we get in the car? Yes or no? We have to be able to make a U-turn and get back on the right path. We cannot give up as soon as we mess up. And now when I go back to our origin, look at what our father and our mother did when they messed up, when they slipped. What did they do? They ate from the tree that they weren't supposed to. What did they do? رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُنَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Our Lord, we've wronged our own selves. We've made a wrong turn. 
And if you do not have mercy on us, if you do not forgive us and have mercy on us, we will be indeed among the losers. Why does Allah tell us this? And what does this have to do with our honor as women and as human beings? Here's what it has to do with it. If we do not have the ability to make that U-turn and come back to Allah when we mess up, we will not be able to get to our destination. Now here is what happens next. You guys ready for this? You don't look ready. You don't seem ready. Or as my friend says, you don't smell ready. <laughs> no. <laughs> what happens next? After the repentance of Adam and Hawa, what does Allah do? Does anyone know the story? He forgives him. Allah tells us, he confirms it, that he forgave him right away. And then what does he do next? He sends him down for his original mission. Remember what he said to the angels even before he was created? Remember what Allah said to the angels even before Adam was created? See, some of us think this life is a punishment. That we're stuck here. But no, Allah said, even before he created Adam, that the intent was to honor Adam and Hawa by making them representatives on this earth. This is not meant to be a punishment. And it is not meant to be a place of suffering. And that's what brings me to the topic that I just recently wrote about called healing the emptiness. Now healing the emptiness is about the fact that in this life we experience pain. Raise your hand if you've never experienced pain. No one. Not even a newborn. Here you don't have to drive. You just have to be alive. The moment a human being comes into this earth, they experience pain. Immediately. That's why the child's screaming when they're born. It's because this life has an element of pain. And this is what the angels are asking about as well. But here is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who's ready for it? I'm going to need to know if you're ready because I can't say it if you're not ready. All right. <laughs> I, <coughs> when Adam was sent down to this earth, alayhi salam, when our father and our mother, they were sent down to this earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent them down with a promise. He said, go down. Some of you, yes, will be enemies one to each other. Do you have any enemies in your life? Maybe. But he also sent them down with a promise. He said, there will be guidance. When that guidance comes, whosoever follows that guidance, listen carefully. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. What does that mean? It's a divine promise that yes, there will be pain in this life. But if you hold tight to the guidance of Allah in this life, you will be safe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون. No fear shall be upon them, nor shall they grieve. Now, what do you think when I tell you that? I just told you that Allah said that if you follow the guidance, you won't have grief or fear. So what do you think about that? I know what you think about that. You think, but wait a minute. I have Iman. 
So many people I know have Iman, they follow the guidance, but they still experience some fear and some grief. And here's what I tell you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not telling us we will not be touched by fear and grief. He is telling us that if we hold on to the guidance of Allah, we will not drown in fear or grief. And that is the promise of Allah. And Allah keeps his promise. Allah tells the truth. So let me explain what that means. As we go through this life, we will be tested. We will experience pain. We will experience loss. Allah tells us, you will verily be tested with something of hunger, something of fear. You will experience some level of fear and you will experience loss. Loss of wealth, loss of people, souls, people that you love, people in your life, and loss of the fruits of your efforts. Have you ever worked really, really hard on something and it just didn't work out? Some of you are, must be living in Jannah, man. <laughs> Not me. Everything works out for me. Everything works out for me. Okay, tell me the address of your Jannah, please. <laughs> I want to come visit. It's impossible. We, we put in effort, and sometimes a lot of effort. God, a lot of effort. To get an outcome, and it doesn't work. This is what Allah is telling us. He's saying, It didn't work out. You tried everything. It didn't work out. This is part of dunya. But then what does Allah say next? Give glad tidings to the people of Sabr. Who are the people of Sabr? الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ There is a definition. He's, he defines these people of Sabr as those who when they are struck with a calamity, any of these things that are listed, something of hunger, fear, loss, Loss of wealth, loss of people, and loss of the fruits of your efforts. You know, you work really hard for a relationship to be successful, and it still isn't successful, or it still ends, or it still fails. You know, we are tested in different ways. We might try really, really hard to please someone. Still not pleased. Does it happen? Still not enough. You know when you're just putting in so much effort, maybe you study really hard for an exam and you still don't do well. Does it happen? You're trying really hard for a certain job and you still don't get it. You're working really hard and you still get, you know, let go from your job. Does it happen? You try really hard to be healthy and you still get sick. Does it happen? I met a woman actually in Australia, and she was talking about how she would exercise every day. She wouldn't, she said she didn't even eat a hamburger her entire life. Like she was like so crazy healthy, you know, healthy, health conscious. And she said, <coughs> I believed that if I do all these things, you know, I work out every day, you know, she was like a personal trainer, she never ate anything unhealthy, you know, she thought that that would guarantee the outcome that she wanted. And you know what happened? She got cancer. And she talked about her story and how it humbled her because it showed her she's not in control. And we can sometimes put in so much effort, invest so much time and money, and it still doesn't work out. 
And that is because we're not in charge. Allah is. And this is part of the tests of dunya. But Allah rewards the people of sabr. وَبَشِّرْ صَادِرِينَ And this is so powerful. Why? Because have you ever gone to someone who has just been struck with a calamity and said, congratulations? Have you done that? That's not what we say, typically. But in a way, Allah is saying that, right? Allah is saying the people who have been struck by tragedy, by loss, by things not working out, he's almost congratulating those people. وَبَشِّرُ الصَّابِرِينَ Like Bushra, what's Bushra? Right? Why? Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them that glad tidings because of the level of their reward. Because of the level of their reward. You understand? In fact, we're told in a hadith that when people in the in Jannah and hereafter see the reward of the people who were tr who were tested, they wish they were tested more in this life. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us, "وَبَشِّرْ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَةٌ قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ." This is so important because Allah is defining the people of sabr. He is talking about them as those who when a calamity befalls them, they respond with indeed we belong to Allah and indeed to Allah we return. What does that mean? Let me give you an example. <coughs> Imagine that I let you borrow my car. Okay? And you get to keep that car I let you keep that car for 10 years. 10 years, right? And then after 10 years, I come back and I take my car back. What's your response? Well, imagine during those 10 years, you had amnesia and you forgot it belongs to me. You thought it belongs to you. What's your response when I come to take it back? How dare you take my car, right? How dare you take my car? But imagine you never had amnesia and I come to take what belongs to me back. What's your response? Indeed, it belongs to you and to you it returns. Yes or no? If we realize that everything belongs to Allah, Everything belongs to Allah. The outcome of our efforts, everything that we love, all of our gifts belong to Allah. So when Allah comes to take it back, how can we possibly respond with sabr? Only in one case, if we realized who the owner actually is. Because only if you realize who the owner is, can you possibly respond with, indeed it belongs to you and to you it returns. It's only the people of amnesia who say, why me? How could you do this to me, God? It's not fair. Why? Because I thought I owned the car. I forgot. I forgot who the owner was. So I'm going to be angry. Why are you taking my car? See, when we don't realize that everything belongs to Allah, we will become very angry when Allah takes things. Do you understand? You become very angry. How could this be taken from me? It's mine. But it isn't. It belongs to Allah. And so Allah is defining for us how to have sabr. Who are the people of sabr? الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبَتٌ قَالُوا إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ That's not just a statement of the tongue. That's not only a statement of the tongue. It's, it can also be a statement of the tongue. It was really cute. Today, the sister dropping us off <laughs> at our hotel. 
she like made a wrong turn and she said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajaun. It was so cute. I was like, wow. <laughs> it's not only a statement of the tongue. It is a way of seeing the world. Do you understand? To recognize that everything belongs to Allah and to Him it returns. Now I want to take a moment, if you allow me, to talk a little more about the meaning of sabr. Because this is very important. Now here in this ayah, Allah defines the people of sabr. But I want to talk a little bit about some of the myths of sabr that we have in our community. Okay? Let me give you an analogy. Imagine that you walk into your house, or maybe you're sleeping in your house, and you hear a smoke alarm. Yeah? So you wake up, you see smoke, then you see fire. Now imagine that you see this fire and you see the smoke, and then you stand there and you fold your arms like this and you say, MashaAllah, I have so much sabr, I'm gonna do nothing. I'm gonna do nothing about this. I'm gonna stand here and I'm gonna watch as my house burns down because mashaAllah, I have sabr. And then you're gonna have people come around you, collecting around you and saying, mashaAllah, look at her sabr. She's doing absolutely nothing about her house burning down. Is that sabr? Not a, not a trick question, guys. Is that sabr? Is that the meaning of sabr? That I'm standing in my own burning house and I'm doing nothing. That's not what sabr is. What should I do if there's smoke and fire in my house? Anyone? Get a fire extinguisher. Call the fire department. Get some water. Do something, yeah? And that is your sabr. Because we have this myth, we have this misunderstanding that sabr means go back to sleep. Your house is burning down, have sabr sister, go back to sleep. Have sabr sister, do nothing, just stand, just stand there and watch. We have this myth, this idea that sabr means keep drinking the poison but keep a smile on your face. Do you know I actually heard that someone say this to me? She says, my mother told me that I should be able to drink poison and keep a smile on my face. This is a lot of our culture, but it is not Islam. It is not Islam and it is not sabr. It is toxic culture and it is to be passive in a way that you stand while your own house is burning down and you don't look for any fire extinguisher and you don't take any action. This isn't Islam. This is not what sabr is. Let me ask you a question. What did Hajar do? What did Hajar do? Hajar, she was in the middle of the desert, right? She was with her child and no one is there. There's no water. There's no one. So my question to you, what did she do? Did she lay down and say, I have so much sabr. I'm just going to lay here. Did she say, I have so much tawakkul that I'm just going to sit here and do nothing? Tell me what she did. She got up and she ran between Safa and Marwa. And did she do it one time? How many times did she do it? Did she do it two times? Did she do it even five times? Seven, 100% on your pop quiz, yes. Seven times. <coughs> do you understand the lesson or no? She's not being passive. She's not saying, I have sabr, so I'm going to be passive and do nothing. She's not saying, I have tawakkur, so I'm going to be passive and do nothing. Oh, I'm going to wait here till Allah saves me. 
Of course she had tawakkul. Of course she had sabr, but she got up and she did something. And we are told to follow in her footsteps, right? You cannot complete Hajj or Umrah, man or woman, without following in her footsteps. She was a woman who was in a bad situation. It's, it's a pretty bad situation to be stranded in a desert. <laughs> but she didn't lay passive. She ran back and forth, back and forth. She didn't give up. <coughs> I'll tell you this. You know, I have a lot of people from all over the world send me messages about their problems. So I read quite a bit of stuff. You know that there is a very common denominator among many of these issues. Many of these messages have something in common. Do you know what it is? Too many of us stay too long in bad situations. And we just sit. I cannot tell you how common. That is the common denominator. We don't get up and take action to improve our situation, to change our situation, to rectify our situation. We just sit passive. We keep drinking the poison and we keep the smile on our face. We stand in burning homes, we fold our arms and we say, Masha Allah, look at my sabr. That's our problem. By and large, that's our problem. This is a definition of sabr we have to rectify. We have to unlearn this un incorrect definition of sabr. We have to unlearn it. Because this is not what we are taught. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, if you see something wrong, try to change it with your hand. And if you cannot change it with your hand, then try to change it with your tongue by, by at least speaking out against it. If it's wrong, if it's unjust, if it's abusive. And he says, if you cannot, you're not able to do either of those things, at least hate it in your heart. And this is the weakest of Iman. So what is he teaching us? He's teaching us that part of Iman is taking action against injustice and abuse and anything that's wrong. Ithm, anything that's wrong. Munkar. Munkar is like a general word for anything bad. But we're not told if you see something bad, turn the other cheek. You see, that's not our religion. He didn't say, when you see munkar, turn the other cheek. He said, try to change it, take action, don't be passive. And I just want to say this. It was after Hajar took action, seven times that she was saved, isn't it? It was after her sa'i that Allah opened for her zamzam. Sometimes we sit passively saying, Allah's gonna change my condition. Allah's gonna save me. But we don't do the sa'i. We don't do the work. Understand? When your house is burned out, burning down, you can say, Allah will save me. Allah will save my house. But you also have to go and get a fire extinguisher and call the fire department. This is part of our responsibility to take action. When the Prophet وسلم, saw a man, he wasn't tying his camel. What did the, what happened? He said, why aren't you tying your camel? He said, because I have trust in Allah. Some of us are like this. We're not tying our camel because I have trust in Allah. And what did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam say to him? He said, tie it, tie your camel, and put your trust in Allah. You have to do both. 
And so if you're in a burning house, your tying of the camel is to take action to extinguish the fire, not to stand there passive, watch it burn and say, I have sabr. Understood? So this is one of the definitions of sabr that is toxic and false. <coughs> There's another common myth um, or false definition of sabr. And that is that sabr means that you don't feel any emotion. That you, never, you don't feel any grief. You don't feel, you basically become a robot. So I'll give you an example to illustrate. Say you're at a funeral and you see some family members at the funeral. One of the family members is crying. Another family member is showing no emotion, just no emotion, straight face, no emotion, shut down. What do many of us think or say? Well, we would probably look at the one who's crying and say, have sabr, have sabr. And we'll look at the one who's showing no emotion and say, Allah, look at the sabr. Am I right? We have somehow linked sabr with showing no emotion. Sabr with not crying. Sabr with being stoic. But this is a false definition. Can I prove it to you? Yaqub alayhi salam. Just open the Quran to Surah Yusuf. Yaqub alayhi salam had sabr on jameel. He had beautiful patience. And yet he cried until he went blind from grief. Yes? He says to Allah, إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى Allah." So he's saying to Allah, indeed I complain of my grief and my sadness to Allah. So what does that mean? It means that he had sabr, he had sabr, in fact he had beautiful patience, sabr and jameel. And at the same time he cried and at the same time he experienced grief. So what does it mean? It means that sabr is not the lack of emotion. Sabr doesn't mean you can't cry. Sabr doesn't mean you can't feel grief. Sabr is that you do not complain against the decree of Allah. You understand? The Prophet وسلم, when he was grieving, in his, in his famous hadith, what does he say? When he lost someone he loved, he said the eyes shed tears and the heart feels grief but the tongue does not utter except what is pleasing to Allah. That is actually the perfect balance, the perfect combination. He said the eyes shed tears and the heart feels grief but the tongue does not utter except what is pleasing to Allah. That is sabr. Can I tell you something super amazing that's going to blow your mind? You ready for this? You don't sound ready. <laughs> Do you know what they find right now in psychology? Oh, wow. I've never gotten tea while I was speaking. This is, this is Dubai, man. Thank you. Bismillah. <laughs> wow. Wow. I think I'm going to have to wait, so it's hot. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, that's sweet. Okay. <laughs> we like our sugar, right? You know, when I travel and I, like, ask for sugar-free stuff, they're like, what? What does that even mean? No, we don't carry that. <laughs> this is very profound. The Prophet Wasallam, listen carefully. So, what they find now, psychologists... What they've discovered is that if you look at basically all the mental health challenges, all the questions that someone might ask, 
How do I overcome depression? How do I overcome my anxiety? How do I stop the panic attacks? How do I heal from my trauma? Do you know that all of these questions have the same answer? This is gonna blow your mind, I hope you're ready. Do you know what the answer to all these questions is? You have to feel your pain. You have to feel your pain. And only after you feel your pain can you release your pain. Isn't that deep? The eyes shed tears and the heart feels grief, but the tongue does not utter except what is pleasing to Allah. This is the only way to really have sabr. The only way, see what he's giving us so deep is a formula. He's actually giving us a formula. And part of it is the eyes shed tears and the heart feels grief. Meaning you are going through the process of experiencing the grief so that you can release it. Because if you don't, it just gets stuck. And that is what causes these different problems. Let me give you an example. You want an example? I'm all about the metaphors. So imagine you take a slice of cheesecake. How many people like cheesecake? <coughs> okay. I don't know if you've ever tasted cheesecake. I mean, how can you not like cheesecake? You take a slice of cheesecake and instead of eating it, you put it inside your purse. Your, you know, $40,000 purse. And then you zip it up. And you say, what cheesecake? Right? What cheesecake? It's in your purse. So you, you don't see it. So that means it disappears, right? Right? Yes? No. <laughs> Have you ever put cheesecake in a purse and it disappeared? It doesn't disappear, folks. See, this is, this is <laughs> step number one. <laughs> Rule number one, it doesn't disappear. What happens to that cheesecake in your Chanel purse after a week? After a month? After a year? What's happened? What happens to that cheesecake after 10 years? Anyone? Yeah, exactly. What happens to it? It isn't cheesecake anymore, it's alive. Literally. It is alive, and if you were to eat it, it would kill you. It's poison. Oh my God, that was, that was intense. It's poison. Many of us, we take our pain, we take our trauma, we take our negative emotions and we don't want to process, we don't want to deal with, we don't want to digest, and we stick it in a purse and we zip it up and we say, it's gone, I don't see it. But it's not gone and it is fermenting. Do you understand? It's rotting, it's turning poison. And many of us are walking around with this unprocessed trauma, unprocessed emotion, unprocessed, unreleased pain. Everyone will experience pain. But if you don't deal with it in the right way, it can kill you. It can make you sick in more ways than one. Not only mentally sick, also physically sick. This is one of the reasons we get sick, physically as well. This is the reason we get things like cancer sometimes. This is the reason we have ulcers. This is the reason we have digestive problems, migraines. All of this is connected to, you know, because you realize our body is connected. You can't say, no, no, it's in the purse. It's not my problem. So here is our issue. Many of us actually think this is sabr. Are you with me?
We think that the cheesecake locked in the purse is our sabr, but it's poisonous. Remember, the eyes shed tears and the heart feels the grief. He is, is, is feeling the pain, isn't suppressing the pain, isn't putting it away in a drawer and locking it up and saying, what pain, what cheesecake? Because that, that cheesecake doesn't disappear and I'll tell you how it shows up. It will show up in your relationships. It will show up in your self-talk, the way you talk to yourself. It will show up in how you parent your child. Because if you have trauma that you haven't dealt with, this is how we pass it on to the next generation. How many of you have heard of the term generational trauma? A few of you. It's just a fancy term for this. You have trauma, you didn't heal it, and so you pass it on to your child. And then your child doesn't heal it, and they pass it on to their child. And then their child doesn't heal it, and they pass it on. We're passing on the rotten cheesecake. But it isn't cheesecake anymore, it's poison. Are you feeling what I'm saying? Because when we're traumatized, and we don't heal from that, we traumatize our children and we traumatize the people around us. You know, she's bringing the Kleenex, it's interesting because um, <laughs> when I was speaking in Brunei, like many years ago, I told a story that made like everybody cry. And so the next time I came, they had tissues inside of the bags they gave every person. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. I'm not going to make you cry, inshallah. But I want to make you feel and I want to make you think. I want to make you feel and I want to make you think. And if, and if it makes you cry, alhamdulillah, that's what prophets did. We need to get over this idea that sabr means not crying. That sabr means suppress. Lock up the cheesecake. MashaAllah, look at my sabr. I think... Um, I can pause there if, if we want to have enough time for questions. How, how am I doing with time? Can someone help me out? I have five minutes. <coughs> Mashallah. All right. I'm going to summarize something for you. I'm going to summarize something for you. Remember at the beginning of this talk, I said that pain is an inevitable part of life. Yeah? Were you there for that part? Okay. But suffering doesn't have to be. When does pain turn into suffering? That's what I want you to go home with to realize. When does pain turn into suffering? Here's when it happens. Go back to the example of the fire alarm. So you're asleep in your bed, you hear the fire alarm, do you guys have fire alarms in your house? Allahu Akbar. You know there's entire countries that have no fire alarms in their homes? <laughs> so the fire alarm wakes you up from your sleep and you want to figure out where's the fire, right? But let me ask you this question. Is a fire alarm a nice sound? Does anybody like the sound of a fire alarm? No. Your pain, listen carefully, your pain is like a fire alarm. Your pain is actually alerting you that there's a fire somewhere in your life, so fix it. Now that's deep. Meaning, meaning, your pain, which is gonna come in different forms. So for some people, their fire alarm is depression. For some people, their fire alarm is anxiety that just doesn't go away, all-consuming. But that is actually alerting you there's a problem that you need to address. The depression isn't the problem. The depression is the alarm. I don't know if you caught me. The depression is the alarm telling you there's another problem that you're ignoring. There's another problem that you're not addressing. 
Maybe there's some cheesecake in the purse that's been there for years that's not being addressed, that's not being healed or processed. And that's why you're having depression. Do you know how much depression is linked to childhood abuse? To childhood trauma? This is the cheesecake that's been sitting there not healed. It's coming out as depression and anxiety. And so when we experience pain, we need to find out what is the root cause? Where is the fire? Understand? I'm experiencing pain and that's my wake up call. It's a fire alarm, but I have to find the fire. Now let me ask you this question. What happens if instead of looking for the fire, I just take out the batteries from the smoke alarm. Anyone? What happens? I don't like the sound, so I take out the smoke, I take out the batteries. What happens then? Well, you can go back to sleep. You don't have to listen to it, but your house is still burning down. And this is what many of us do with our pain. We just try to take out the batteries. In other words, we just look to escape. We just look to numb. We just don't want to feel the pain. Some people go to alcohol. Some people go to drugs. Some people go to social media. Some people go to physical pleasure. But what they're actually doing is trying to numb their pain. This is the actual essence of addiction. Addiction is pain that is unresolved and you're trying to escape it. It's the taking, it's the removing of the batteries instead of looking for the source of the fire. أقولي قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك.